Welcome to the Tepper School of Business Multimedia Series. For more information on the Tepper School at Carnegie Mellon, please visit us at www.tepper.cmu.edu slash multimedia. And now, here's your selected video. So information asymmetry in education means that the parents and the policymakers don't observe everything, or at least not directly, of what goes on inside the school. The reason is that they are not at the school all the time. And for that reason, the school has an incentive to under-provide effort, let work less hard than it would otherwise. Uh, this is called a moral hazard problem. Moral hazard problems are pervasive in many areas of economic life. For instance, they happen among employers and employees, regulated companies and the regulator, and economists have studied moral hazard problems in all of these areas of economic life, but for some reason they have not studied them in education. So my co-author, Pierre Ling, and I thought that this was a really interesting question that we needed to study, so Pierre brought his background on information asymmetries in the corporate sector, and I brought in my background in large-scale reform in education, and we decided to take a serious, systematic look at this problem. When I, as a parent, don't observe directly, completely what's going on in the school, I can undertake certain actions that will give me a sense of how hard the school is working. I can talk with the teacher, with the principal, I can parse out the information that the school is sending home, I can attend the parent-teacher conferences, I can exchange information with other parents that are engaged in a similar information quest, and all of these things will give me a sense of how hard the school is working. Now, when the school senses this pressure, it provides greater effort, it responds to this pressure. Why? Because if it doesn't and the parents are watching, that can be very costly for the school. It can cause the school in terms of reputation, it can, lose the school to, it can lead the school to lose students, it can make it harder for the school to attract students in the future. Monitoring systems are failing, parental monitoring systems are failing for two reasons. The first one is that parental monitoring is a group activity and hence it's subject to free riding. If I know you're monitoring the teacher, why should I do it as well? I can benefit from your action without having to undertake it myself. So for this reason, for this free riding incentive, we are never going to have as much parental monitoring as we would like. And this is a problem that affects parental monitoring across the boards in all schools. Now there's a separate problem that affects some schools more than others. And it's related to the fact that different parents face different costs and benefits of monitoring. As for the costs, let's imagine a highly educated parent. For this kind of parent, it's relatively easy to figure out what the teacher is doing, to question the teacher, to probe the principal. This parent probably interacts in a social circle where other parents are doing similar things, and so there is a, a fluid exchange of information that allows the parent to figure out how hard the school is working. For a low educated parent, it's the exact opposite situation. So the cost that parents face is very different, and if the cost of monitoring is high, I am probably not going to do a lot of it. The benefits are also different. If I send my child to a small school where I feel that my parental input is likely to make a difference, I'm also more likely to monitor. On the other hand, if I have my child at a big school, in a big public school system where I don't feel I have much of a voice, where I feel that I have to go all the way up to the Board of Education to make a difference, again, I'm not likely to engage in public monitoring very much. And so for this reason, because costs and benefits are different, different parents are going to undertake different levels of parental monitoring. And schools attract different kinds of parents. And for that reason, schools are going to show different levels of parental monitoring. And the extreme case of this, I think, is in inner city public schools. In these kinds of schools, it's very costly for parents to monitor. The benefits of monitoring are very low because you don't feel you have much of an impact in these kinds of schools, and so parents don't monitor very much. And as a result of that, the school doesn't work very hard either, of course, to the detriment of the children. And that's on top of other problems that these schools face by virtue of having a disadvantaged student population. And to compound the problem even more, is the reality that when parents choose where to send their children to school, they are looking at who else is going to school, whether those other parents are monitoring the school or not, and as a result, how hard the school is working. So if I have a choice among schools, I am certainly not going to choose this one school where the parents are not monitoring and the school is not working hard. So that only compounds the self-selection of people 
among schools only compounds the original lack of monitoring in the schools to begin with. So when we have a problem of moral hazard, the only thing that we can do is monitor more. In this case, monitor the schools more. And there are two alternative approaches. We can do public monitoring, that is a regulation-based approach, where some public agency monitors the schools, or we can do a market-based approach where the monitoring is private and it's done by the families. In the case of regulation-based approaches, there is a regulator, a public agency, think about the State Department of Education or the Federal Department of Education, that establishes standards and norms that the schools must meet, and that also establishes rewards and punishments that the schools will experience depending on how they are meeting those standards. So in the idea of regulation-based approaches, we discipline the schools entirely through the regulator. And regulation-based approaches can be very effective at eliciting greater effort on the part of the school, but they also have a number of shortcomings. The first of them is that they are fiscally costly. It costs taxpayers money to uh, implement this bureaucracy that is going to monitor the schools. It also costs the schools to comply with the regulations established by this public agency. In addition, the school may have to alter its normal activities so that it can comply with the norms established by the regulator. A second shortcoming of regulation is that it can have unintended consequences. So if I as a parent know that the state is watching the schools, why should I watch the school? In other words, public monitoring on the part of the regulator may have the unintended consequence of crowding out the private monitoring that some parents may otherwise do. And as a result, the school in the end may face less total monitoring than it was facing before the regulation. And there's another loss there in that the parent is always closer to the reality of the school than the public monitor, in other words, the regulator is. And there's a third shortcoming associated with regulation, and it has to do with the fact that once you put the whole disciplining of the school on the shoulders of the regulator, it really matters what the features of the regulation are. In other words, are the standards, the rewards, and the punishment well set, well calibrated relative to the goal that you want to accomplish? Also, whose interests does this regulator represent? Does the regulator represent the interests of the families and the students, or does the regulator represent the interests of the schools? And uh, third, who regulates the regulator? Who is this regulator accountable to? There is no one-size-fits-all solution to improving education. People have been for years on the quest for a magic bullet, and it's been a misguided quest. There are trade-offs between regulation-based and market-based approaches. So if we start with markets, markets are very good because they give families options to attend schools, and in so doing, they unleash the forces of competition. That can lead to greater efficiency to the extent that the private sector is more efficient at using resources and funding. Market-based approaches also allow for a much better match between what parents want and what schools offer. Market-based approaches discipline the schools without the need for any kind of bureaucratic intervention, but market-based approaches rely on private monitoring. And so for parents who are capable of doing this kind of monitoring, this is a great tool. For parents for whom monitoring the school is costly, market-based approaches are probably not the right answer. So anytime you implement a large-scale policy, and education policies are large-scale policies because they affect so many people, you have unintended consequences that the policymaker is usually not aware of when they're first implemented. In the case of regulation, for instance, the uh, critical unintended consequence has to do with public monitoring crowding out private monitoring. If I as a parent know that the state is watching, why should I watch the school? I can free ride on the efforts that are being undertaken by the state. And so as a result of that, the school may end up facing less total monitoring than it was at the beginning. And there's a real loss there because the parent is much closer to the reality of the school than the state is. In the case of vouchers, one unintended consequence is that for parents for whom monitoring is very costly, the voucher may not be useful. If that kind of parent takes the voucher to a private school because a parent can monitor the school very well, the school is just not going to provide effort. So going to the private school is not going to improve things for that kind of parent. What about staying in the public school? Staying in the public school may not be an improvement either because the parents that were capable of monitoring may have left for the private sector already using the voucher. And so the parents that remain in the public schools are really not capable of providing monitoring. So at the end of the day, the student body that is left in the public school has lower capacity to monitor than it had before and is hence going to receive less effort 
on the part of the public school. So I like the word balance because it suggests that we're better off combining these approaches than relying on any of them alone. You have to keep certain things in mind in order to strike the right balance. The first one is you have to know the strengths and weaknesses of each of these tools. Market-based approaches are really very good for people who are capable themselves of monitoring the schools. Regulation-based approaches are necessary for people who are not capable of monitoring themselves the schools. So you have to know strengths and weaknesses of every method. The second thing is that you have to keep fiscal considerations in mind. In other words, you want to ask yourself, what is the most efficient, the most cost-effective way of attaining the outcome of interest? And so you might think that heavy-handed regulation on all public schools in the country is going to take you whatever you want, but that, not may, that may not be the most cost-effective way of getting there. Once again, for parents for whom it's relatively inexpensive to monitor the school, we may just want to rely on their own private monitoring because that may be cheaper than mounting a machinery of public monitoring for those schools that actually don't need it. So you want to keep fiscal considerations in mind. So one example of this kind of balance would be a private school voucher program that is supplemented with public monitoring of at least some private schools and perhaps public monitoring of public schools as well. Why? Well, because as we have already discussed, one problem with private school vouchers is that they may not work for parents for whom it's costly to monitor the school. Well, and so we may want to have some public monitoring on the private schools that receive the voucher so that these schools are forced to work, even though the parents themselves cannot monitor the schools too much. We may also want to have some public monitoring on the public schools that the children used to be to begin with to make sure that even though the parents that were monitoring those public schools the most and who have left the public school by using the voucher, even though those parents have left, the school is still providing an effort because the regulator is watching. So that's an example in which we're combining a market-based mechanism with a regulation-based mechanism. Another example is charter schools. So charter schools are public schools of choice, and by being schools of choice, they are relying, relying on market-based mechanisms, but at the same time, they're regulated, usually by the entity that authorizes them. An important conclusion is that there is no magic bullet. Market-based approaches work better in some circumstances, regulation-based approaches work better in other, and for the reasons we have discussed, we are much better off thinking of these approaches as complements, as working together, than we are viewing them as substitutes. That's one important conclusion. The other one is that we have to do everything in our power to lower the monitoring costs for the families. No one is as close to the schools and to the children as the parents are. Policymakers will never be that close. So anything we can do to lower monitoring costs by, for parents is useful. For instance, by providing accurate, timely, reliable information on school performance, etc. Now, in terms of future research, we think that there are two very promising avenues here. One has to do with teachers and the other one has to do with principals and school structure. One thing we know from the current research is that the most important input that schools provide in education is teachers. But we also know from the current research that teachers vary greatly in their ability to raise child achievement, in their effectiveness. And we also know that when a rookie teacher is hired, it's actually very hard to predict how good this person is going to be. So in light of these realities, what is the best system we can design to learn how good a teacher is over time and then to compensate, promote, and eventually dismiss teachers based on their teacher effectiveness? Also, what are the best metrics to use to learn about teacher effectiveness. Test scores cannot reveal everything about a teacher's effectiveness. And so what different, what mixture of metrics, test scores, direct observation in the classroom, etc., can we use in order to learn about their effectiveness? Also, how does that affect not only the effort of the current teachers, but also who chooses to become a teacher? And how does it affect the sorting of teachers across schools. Presumably, we want to have at least many effective teachers in the schools where they are most needed. And so what kind of mechanisms can we design to place these best teachers in the schools where they're most needed? But of course, the thing that we're not talking about so far, that it's not really being discussed much now, is that to have teachers evaluated and allocated in this way, we need to have principals who have the right incentives to do that. And so what kind of incentives do principals and perhaps even school boards have to face to deliver these kind of outcomes? And then from that perspective, we go back to the issue of regulation versus markets. Do markets have an advantage 
in giving flexibility to principals, to teachers, to school structures to accomplish that type of outcome.